and welcome to episode 116, sweet 16 of 100. This is the Tennis Podcast. My name is Nick Amell and I'm your one host. Uh, you're inaccurate because I'm also sidekick host. I'm Brandon. Well, that's why we can't depend on you for facts. Uh, this is the show where we share a lot of facts, fun facts, and trivia because we cover top 10 lists on pretty much anything and everything. One of us brings a top 10-ish list, the other tries to guess without knowing what that list is ahead of time. Today we're going to cover a top 10 list, but first let's flip this shit on its head and do something that we usually do at the end of the episode, and I'm going to start with some podcast reviews. Kick it off. Every week on every episode, I read reviews from listeners. First one comes from Ghost733 on Apple Podcasts. We'll see if the trend keeps up of people saying they don't want Brandon on the show and they don't like listening uh, to him. Trend of one, and nobody said nobody said that. No, we're at a hundred percent over the last two weeks, nope. just about. Ghost seven thirty three says Nick and Brandon have a great dynamic, and the list countdown format creates many fun moments. It's actually funnier when they can't pick out things in the top ten. Laugh and cry, crying while laughing emoji face. Huh. The banter is natural and witty and I'm certain Brandon just can't be phased by anything. Do, you be, <laughs> I got news for you. 100% wrong. I'm fucking, <laughs> I'm phased every day. Consider him phased <laughs> at the moment. So, they did not say like, so this goes against the trend. We have to get some data analysts on it to, to see what this means in the bigger picture, but it goes against the trend of wishing you off the show. However, they did still I don't know. What is that like a... Mention my name? Yeah, they mentioned you. Sure. So, the next one comes from How the BL on Apple Podcast says, Crazy about tunes! Love the ep on Looney Tunes, a personal childhood fave of mine. Oh, I wondered where... <laughs> I wondered what the, what the fucking context of tunes was for a minute. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and that uh, episode 111 was the Looney Tunes episode. So yeah, Brandon, you got off easy this week. No one, no one wished you'd die or anything like that. No one came at me. Yeah. If you want me to read your review, go write a review. And now, without further ado, let me introduce this week's topic. Brandon, I'm going to do that by asking you a question. Mm -hmm. Do you enjoy games? Yes. <laughs> do you find games to be fun? A, fun, B, interesting, or C, None of the above, or D, both A and B. Yeah, I'll say D, A and B. What kind of are we talking? <laughs> tabletop games? Are we talking video yeah. games? We're talking the best-selling board games or tabletop games, however you want to call it. Okay. Best-selling board games of all time, and this comes from MoneyInc.com. They did an article that they referenced other sources, but I'm using MoneyInc.com, supplementing with Wikipedia. And according to Money Inc., board games have for a long time been preferred for spending quality family time. But, uh, I hate playing board games with my family. Uh, and the worldwide board game market is predicted to go over $12 billion by the year 2023. $12 billion industry just to play some games. Now, tell me more about you don't like to play board games with your family. Do you mean your parents and your siblings or do you mean your family as in your your wife and children or, or both any of your family members well i meant the former i don't like playing with my parents and siblings are they better than you no they just i don't know i just don't really like doing anything with them <laughs> okay <laughs> i'll accept that all right board games best selling this is by uh units sold so the number of board games sold not the dollars and this is all of history. How about Battleship? Battleship? Most famous for the shitty sci-fi movie in 2012. I never saw it, but it, was it Space we'll, Aliens? We'll get to it. We'll get to it. Okay. We'll get to it. Uh, Battleship's number seven uh, with a one, 100 plus million Battleship games sold to date. Do you have Battleship at your house? I don't. You know, I think I've only played Battleship like once. When I was a kid, I had electronic battleship, and the only difference between that and regular battleship is it would make a, a sound. It would go, when you fired, it would go, mm -hmm. and if you hit, Thank you. it would go, mm -hmm. or in Seinfeld, when Jerry and Elaine play, Jerry makes Elaine go make that sound. Oh. Remember? <laughs> yeah. She goes, I have. And Jerry nods. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had an electric one that made the sound, but now uh, we still have a battleship. Do you, you don't have it now. But no, I, 
You've barely Battleship's played Battleship's never been my bag. No. So there you go. Hot take. Uh, the game of Battleship is thought to have its origins in the French game... La, t- La Toc. Menage à toi. La t- <laughs> sure. And the game is said to have been played by Russian officers before World War I. And the first commercial version of the game as we know it now was published in 1931 in the United States by the company called Starex. Although since 1967, Milton Bradley, in 67 they introduced the version that has the plastic boards and pegs and they, I believe they're still the distributors of it. So, Brandon, why don't you give the folks at home a summary of how you play this magnificent game? You set up the little plastic board, and there's a wall in between you and your opponent, a little plastic wall. So, you've got a board on top with pegs in it, and on the bottom with pegs in it, and on top, you're keeping track of where your opponent's ships might be arranged on their side. And you where your arrange- opponent's ships are re- arranged? Ships. Ships? And I don't know. It's like it's like bingo, only you're trying to hit a battleship. <laughs> okay. Well, very well done. You you almost got the Wikipedia description verbatim. But did you know Battleship was one of the earliest games that was also made into a computer game as early as 1979 with the Z80 CompuColor? Have you ever heard of that? The I Z80 haven't. CompuColor. Mm-mm. Yeah, me either. So let's talk about the movie in 2012. Military science fiction action movie Battleship was released, inspired by the Bilton Bradley game. Really? <laughs> well, you know, hold on. The word inspired uh-huh. means like some writer was at home playing Battleship and he was like, oh my God, I am overcome with creative energy. <laughs> I, uh, he, yeah. he flipped over the game board, his kids were crying, and he ran to his office and started typing. Instead, it was somebody at the studio is friends with the guy who makes Battleship and they're like, I got dollar signs in my eyes. Get some goofball to write me a script. I've not seen it, but as far as I can tell, the only thing Battleship about it is the name and like they're on a battleship. Yeah, there weren't space aliens in the game. No, no. It was a hugely expensive movie, like $300 million budget, and it barely made that back if, well, at least uh, on production. So the movie's considered a bomb. Uh, But I have a fun fact for you. We may have touched on this in a past episode because I feel like we've talked about this before somewhere. But my sister was an extra in Battleship. There you go. What was she? Where was she? I don't know. What was the setting? I don't know. Haven't seen it. <laughs> Just know she's in it. Wait, she's in a movie and you haven't even seen the movie? Did I stutter? Well, go, you should see the movie. Nah. You spend like $4 on... Nope. Okay. Uh, she's been in a lot of shit. I don't... I have, uh, that spark is gone. I don't give a shit anymore. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's Battleship. Never seen the movie and I won't. Now, out, any chance of me seeing it is now gone because of your f- fucking pressure. Sounds like you hate Battleship. I don't hate it. I just am indifferent to it. It's number seven, though, with 100 million units sold. Um, I'm going to go for a few that may not be super obvious. Like, uh, how about Hungry Hungry Hippos? <laughs> no, uh, that's a good guess. Hungry Hungry Hippos is not in the top 20. Oh, is Mousetrap? Oh, that's a good... I forgot mousetrap about Mousetrap. is awesome because you didn't even have to play the game. You just build the Mousetrap and play with that. Do you remember the game Don't Wake Daddy? <laughs> yeah. It's what a <laughs> weird game, but it's, it's true. Sundays are yeah. my days to sleep in. And <laughs> Don't wake daddy because he'll come kick your ass. Do not wake daddy. Yeah. He'll... <laughs> when you wake the daddy up in the, in the game, doesn't he sit up with a terrifying look on his face? <laughs> yes, that's what I was going to say. He doesn't just sit up or like, Ooh, he fucking snaps awake like a vampire <laughs> that was just hit with a sun. He like rises the sunlight from, hit. Yeah. from the waist up. He snaps awake and his eyes are bulging bigger <laughs> than Don Knotts. Yep. And he's looking at, towards you. <laughs> Don't wake daddy. Like another name for that game is you done fucked up. <laughs> I think that's what they call it in uh, some of the European countries. You know, they have different yeah. names for the games. <laughs> you done fucked up. Well, none of that shit's in the top 20. Okay. Ooh. Well, a game sort of similar to that that has, is popular and maybe be in the po- top 20, um, Operation. Mm-mm. No. No. No Operation in the top 20. These are good guesses. I wrote them down as mm-hmm. my, like, surprise they're not in the top 20 list. But What about uh, Sorry? No Sorry. No Trouble. Okay. That was my... Sorry and Trouble are so similar, I 
I get them mixed up. Mm -hmm. None of them. Okay, how about where does Scrabble fall on the list? You know, where do you guess? I'm going to guess number four. Okay. So, what type of voodoo spell did you buy this week that lets you see through my eyes into my note? I accidentally here? got a, a foot in my bucket at KFC, and I've been using that <laughs> to get my way in the world. Well, you got your way here, because Scrabble is number four. It's, it's sold 150 million plus boards since 1938. The, the history of Scrabble is kind of interesting. So, in 1938, American architect Alfred Mosher Butts, and it's B-U-T-T-S. They weren't, weren't mincing letters or words with the butts. <laughs> Alfred Mosher Butt. He's a real mosh butt, I gotta say. Well, he created the game as a variation on an earlier game he invented called Lexico. He manufactured a few sets himself, which intrigued me because, Brandon, if let's say you had an idea today for, like, this is a great idea for a board game. I got to do this. Mm -hmm. Would it ever even occur to you to, like, make one yourself? I mean, you might make, like, a prototype, like, out of cardboard or something, but yeah, I would think you, you like, have actually... To make, oh, yeah. to make multiple copies of it? Yeah. To manufacture it? No. He handmade them, like, multiple copies to sell. I mean, that is cool i bet they're they would be expensive even back then but no I, yeah i think you'd make a prototype and then try to get it like i think if now if you made something that had pieces to it mm -hmm. like something that maybe you assembled or maybe it had a small structure i think you would probably go have it like 3d printed yeah that's a good point but think about scrabble has tons of pieces like i don't know hundreds i guess probably or at mm -hmm. least i don't know 100 I, I don't know how many but that's a lot Back then, you had to manufacture every little tiny letter. Yeah, I... Not worth it. Yeah, I wonder how he, like, made the actual letter. I mean, it's not very interesting podcast material, but yeah, I do. No. Well, Alfred made a real bud of himself. Am I right? <laughs> well, in 1948, this is 10 years later, a guy named James Brunat uh, in Connecticut, mm -hmm. he came across the game and renamed it Scrabble, which mm -hmm. is a real word, which means to scratch frantically. So, I know, Brandon, you scrabble your balls often. Sure. And according to um, legend, Scrabble's big break came in 1952 when Jack Strauss, president of Macy's, played the game on vacation. Upon returning from vacation, where he was presumably scrabbling his balls frantically, uh, when he returned, he was surprised to find that his store did not carry the game. He placed a large order, and within a year, quote, everyone had to have one. So, the, of Scrabble. the guy who named it Scrabble purchased it from butts brunat had come across it i don't remember how and he mm -hmm. he like adapted it made his own version called scrabble he ripped off butts he did tell the folks at home brandon how do you play scrabble in like a sentence or two you got the little letter pieces and you put them on the board and try to make a word and the longer the word the more crazy rare seldom used letters in it the more points like z. you get mm -hmm. yeah q z is a big one q and the game is sold in 121 countries, available in more than 30 languages, and roughly one-third of American and British homes, uh, a third of America and a half of British homes have a Scrabble set in the house. That's pretty powerful. Yeah, they're a smarter culture than Americans. Yeah, we'll get to that. Like in every American home, instead of Scrabble, we have... I don't know. Flashlight. Like everybody knows is like really good at thumb wrestling and arm wrestling and slapping each other. <laughs> uh, I do remember uh, that's the game my family and I played most, slapping each other. <laughs> slapping. Just sitting at the table and it's your turn to slap. You just slap the person next to you until you're the last one standing. Uh, well, I know you know this one already. Uh, I'm sure everyone knows this, but just for the sake of the few that don't know, Scrabble was inducted into the National Toy Hall of Fame in 2004. Oh, yes. Sorry to repeat a fact that you all probably know already. In my last Scrabble note, that Scrabble was turned into a daytime game show on NBC in 1984. It ran into the 90s. Its tagline in promotional broadcasts was, quote, Every man dies, not every man truly Scrabbles. Oh, my God, really? <laughs> yeah. Every man dies, not every man truly Scrabbles. But to that I say... Now that I know the true meaning of the word Scrabble, which is to scratch frantically, I disagree strongly. Every man Scrabbles. Every man Scrabbles.
What about Boggle? Boggle, that's another one I forgot. No, not in the top 20. How about Yahtzee? Nope, not in the top 20. Clue. Clue. So you have seven Battleship and four Scrabble, so where's Clue? Three. Five. Your voodoo is worn off. I lost my mojo. Uh, Clue's number five. I find Clue to be an extremely overrated game. Yep. But it has sold 150 million or more units. It was created in 1944 when an English musician applied for a patent of his invention of a murder mystery themed game originally named Murder! With an exclamation point. (laughs) Much better name. We almost named our podcast that. Shortly thereafter, that guy Pratt, his name's Pratt, and his wife, uh, who had helped design the game, presented it to Waddington's executive, Norman Watson, who (laughs) immediately purchased it. That guy's a, that's a guy with really big thighs and a meaty butt. I think of Waddington as one of those guys that has like, you know, jowls. Yeah, he kind of talks like this. You know, actually, swear to God, first thing I thought of in my mind was, have you seen Monsters, Inc., the first one? Yeah. Well, the boss in that is like an octopus guy. Yep. And he wears like a little He's tuxedo He's very big top. and jolly. Yeah. Yeah. That's who I think of, like a human version of that. That's Waddington, or the, uh, Waddington's executive. The Waddingtons <laughs> are known for their jowls. <laughs> well, they presented it to that guy, mm-hmm. and he purchased it and provided the trademark name of Cluedo, or Cluedo? What an idiot. <laughs> it's Clue with D-O on the end. Yeah, what, what the fuck? Why are you messing it? It's like taking a great <laughs> name and then just adding something stupid on the end. Although the patent was granted in 1947, post-war shortages postponed the game's official UK launch until 1949. It was simultaneously licensed in the US to Parker Brothers, uh, where it was named Clue. But I think it might still be called Cluedo or Cluedo in the UK. I find that really strange. Like, Clue is a word. What, the, what are you doing? It's a play on the word clue and ludo, which is Latin for I play. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I play clue. Okay, well, yep. uh, again, I guess the British are smarter than me. They can't be that smart because they put their dates in reverse. So, The object of the game, well, you tell me, what's the object of the game, Brandon? You're so smart. To figure out who murdered somebody, or where they did it, and with what weapon. Was it Mr. Mustard in the library mm-hmm. with a Colonel candlestick? Mustard. Yeah, Colonel Mustard, not mean Mr. Mustard. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's pretty much it. Each player assumes the role of one of six suspects and attempts to deduce the correct answer by strategically moving around the game. Uh, I don't think there's that much strategy. Yeah, there's strategy? I thought it was just landing on shit until you can guess it. Yeah, and betraying everyone you can. I do like a game of betrayal. Mm-hmm. Well, I found this interesting, I didn't realize this, that Cluedo was originally marketed as the great new detective game, and a deal was quickly struck to license the great new Sherlock Holmes game from the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle estate. Advertising mm-hmm. at, the t- at the time suggested players would take on the guise of Sherlock Holmes following the path of the criminal, but no depictions of Holmes appear in the advertising or on the box. Okay. Yeah, that... W- Very misleading. That would have been a great <laughs> way to sell that game. Sherlock Holmes board game. Even if you haven't read a Sherlock mm-hmm. Holmes book, everyone you, knows who it is. You know who he is, and you'd like to, you know, be the detective. Instead of Clue, you're just a nameless. You're just a person, right? You're not nameless, but yeah, oh, you no, are you're a not. You're nameless. You're one of these idiot party goers. Instead of the one everybody wants to be, Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. Holmes, Robert Downey Jr. But it's Sherlock Holmes. Well, see, they had a, they had a deal already with the uh, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle estate. He he wrote the Sherlock Holmes books. So why not just put Sherlock Holmes somewhere in the game? Yeah, you're sitting on a gold mine. He's nowhere in the game other than the name or, or the nickname, the Great New Sherlock Holmes game. So it's very stupid. But uh, with the launch of the 1972 United States edition, TV commercials showed Holmes and Watson engaged in a particularly competitive game. And adjusting with the times, and I'm sorry, but the game would not be fucking competitive between Sherlock Holmes and dumbass Stooge Watson. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Right? It'd be like if you and I were playing. Just ridiculous. Adjusting with the times, though, in 1979, U.S. commercials then turned to a detective resembling a bumbling Inspector Clazoo from the popular Pink Panther film franchise. Looks for clues. 
Clouseau, whatever. Who gives a fuck? In 1986, the marketing slogan added classic detective game, which persisted through the 2000s. So yeah, a lot of a lot of weird marketing with this game. The detectives on it now should be like the people from like uh, NCIS. No, they should just be the, the internet detectives from Don't Fuck With Cats on Netflix. Just fucking random ass <laughs> regular people in their pajamas at a computer. Lastly, the game has spawned a franchise including musicals, books, and Brandon's favorite movie from the 80s. Or was no, it 90s? I don't, I don't care. I care anything for that movie. Never seen it, and I won't. That's clue number five. How about the game of life? The world's worst game on the top ten, the game of life. Uh-huh. With 50 million units sold at number ten. That's a lot lower than I would have guessed. Really? Okay. I think ten is a, the right spot for it. If I remember right, the options in the game of life are really limited. Options like what? Like the options for what you can do in your life. Oh, uh, you know, I haven't played since I was like eight years old, so I... Oh. You don't have any notes on what the fucking Game of Life is about? Yeah. Well, oh. I do, but okay, let me tell you about the goddamn Game of Life, Brandon. Okay. It was originally created in 1860 by Milton Bradley as the checkered Game of Life. <laughs> 1860, and then the Civil War started and everyone was it's like, we don't have time for this shit. Life is too <laughs> real. Life is not a game, Milton. What I thought was interesting as it's the first game created by Bradley and so far that we've talked about, it's the first game that was like invented by a company and not a person that later sold it to a company. So, yeah. Game of Life is a very corporate game created right before the Civil War. But since 2002, it's published by Hasbro. The game revolves around what usually happens in our daily lives. So, who the fuck wants to... It's like, I think, a George on Seinfeld pitching the show about nothing the first mm -hmm. time. And NBC's like, so what happens? You're reading a book on the show? And Jerry's like, well, maybe something happens while you're reading the book. And George goes, no, 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 no nothing no. happens. That's the game of life. The game starts with each player deciding whether or not to get a job first or go to college and get the job later. <laughs> yeah, what if you don't want to do either one of those things? Yeah, what if you just want to start an OnlyFans? What if you want to take... Yeah, what if you want to start an OnlyFans? What if you want to take a year off to go backpacking in Europe? All right, hippie. Hmm? They then complete the goals by playing with the cards that they fill their hands. They pay for the cost of the goals in terms of time or money. The money and time that a player will have to, play, to pay get assigned at specific points and the player that will have the most points at the end becomes the winner. Aren't you glad I read that? Mm -hmm. It usually uh, happens that way. The person with the most points becomes the winner. I just love the idea of like choosing to get a job as like a central part of this children's game. Uh, <laughs> Here are the narrow choices you have in life. Do you want to get a job now or do you want to get a job later? Do you want to hate your job now and or hate your job later and fucking yeah. jump off this top floor of the office building you work on? Yeah, there should be an option at the end of the game. Like one of the board pieces just leads off the board where you can flick your piece. <laughs> 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 That's the real winner because he's fucking done with the game of life, right? Yeah. That, that piece. I took this game into my own hands. So, how much better does the game of life become when it's one of these other additions? There's the Star Wars version of the game of life. <laughs> it's got to be like you either yeah. join the light side or you join the Imperial Academy or... <laughs> which is still more fun than getting a job. I got to tell you, only fucking like n nerds and narcs join the light side. Well, though. I would mean, you rather get a job or would you rather get a job in space? You already know the answer. Everything's better in space. Yeah. Well, what about the Simpsons game of life? I don't know anything about it, but What I, is Homer's job? I don't remember. He's the safety technician at the nuclear power plant. Okay. So, you could do that. It doesn't look very fun when he does it. No, but does fucking going to college on a board game look fun either? No. None of this is fun. <laughs> The game of life is a punishment. What about the Hello Kitty game of life? What does Hello Kitty do in, in her day? Well, who is this appealing to, by the way? Little girls? Does I mean, Hello, does Hello Kitty act like she's a cat or act like she's a little girl who just looks like a cat? The latter. She's a little girl that happens to be a cat. Okay. She doesn't like lick she's herself not, clean. <laughs> no, she's wa not walking on all fours, meowing, pissing in the litter box and then licking herself. No. Is there, yeah. Is there a picture somewhere out there of Hello Kitty licking her butt? I guarantee it. Okay. Two more. The Pokemon Game of Life, <laughs> where you, I'm sure you choose to become a Pokemon trainer and master. 
Mm -hmm. The Family Guy game of life. Okay. <laughs> That's just because Seth MacFarlane is like, <laughs> what can I slap my name on and get some money for now? Hey, you got to do it. Yeah, Wouldn't he's... You... Mm -hmm. He's laughing all the way to the bank. Good for Wouldn't him. Wouldn't you sign off on a tennis podcast, Game of Life? Yeah, I don't care anything about that. Like, They can choose to be a sidekick host or a, a, a regular host. I'm sure Seth MacFarlane has some things that he would never like. He wouldn't sell out on th things that are more like passion products. But no, on Family Guy and Cleveland Show and American Dad and whatever else, he's just going to... He's going to ride that. I think all he likes to really do in real life is drink like expensive scotch and play piano. Does he play piano? Yeah, he, yeah. Just lost all respect for him. Am I right, everyone? <laughs> Don't got no time for piano players. Musicians. All right, so you got Game of Life at 10, Battleship at 7, Clue at 5, and Scrabble at 4. Life-changing inspiring, uplifting, orgasmic. I love it more than I love my own children. This is what members have been quoted saying about the Tennis Podcast Patreon, maybe. Either way, if you're a regular listener of the Tennis Podcast, you really are doing yourself a disservice by not signing up for our Patreon. Here's why. The stupid ad you're listening to right now, it's horrible, right? I hate it even as I'm reading it. But our Patreon members skip this and all other ads every episode. That's right. No more interruptions during the show. No ads. Plus, this very episode you're listening to right now, and pretty much every episode, comes out early every week. That means you can listen to me and Brandon talk about life-altering topics, as we do, every week, and you get to do that before anyone else. If that's not enough, me and Brandon also do bonus episodes every month exclusively for Patreon members. Our bonus episodes usually cover ground outside of top 10 lists. Some of our most popular ones so far include The Life and Times of Dr. Phil, Brandon Answers BuzzFeed Quizzes, Is Nick Smarter Than a Fifth Grader, Celebrity Quotes and Fun Facts, and more. There's two dozen plus bonus episodes ready for your gross little ears right now, with new bonus episodes added every month. The only way to listen to those is on Patreon. And there's even more, like free merch and swag, but I'll go ahead and stop there. If you're ready to upgrade your tennis experience, trademark pending, then take two minutes now to go to patreon.com slash tennis pod to get started. If you've never used Patreon before, I promise you signing up is super easy. It takes literally a minute. And the best part, you can sign up for as little as $2 per month. That's less than the price of an airport hot dog. Just go to patreon.com slash tennis pod now to sign up. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash one zero I-S-H-P-O-D. Sign up now so you don't have to listen to this fucking ad again. We'll see you on the other side. How about Batgammon? Batgammon. Yeah, what number? Oh, God. Nine? Eight. So you're close. 88 million units sold for Batgammon. Have you played Batgammon? Not in a long time. I don't even remember how to play it. I've never played it. I mean, I've definitely like seen it. I've heard of it. Never played it. And I won't. I will not play it. You've heard it here first. You I will refuse? Not play it. The history of Batgammon. I think it's, it's like the oldest. The world's, yeah, it's world's oldest game. But not the oldest. Oh. It's, uh, I think, the second oldest on this list. It's nearly 5,000 years old. Origins in uh, Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq. Shout out to everyone listening in Iraq right now. The world's oldest set of dice relatable to the game was discovered in this region. It was first introduced in the U.S. in the 20, 1920s in New York City among members of gaming clubs in the Lower East Side. Isn't it interesting that it came 5,000 years ago, but it didn't make it to the U.S. until the 1920s, or at least not popular in the U.S.? Yeah. Cool. Well, th here's how you play. So everyone take, take some notes now. It involves the use of several tactics as well as probability. A player can move his pieces over several spaces depending on the toss of a dice. The toss of the dice makes it utilize the probability function since it falls on any side. This is so fucking boring. The pieces move as the player counters the move that the opponent makes. And I guess I left off how to win. Must not be important. But like chess... Uh, backgammon has been studied with great interest by computer scientists because they say smart people play chess. They also say smart people play backgammon. But here's the controversy of the day, Mr. Brandon. Mm -hmm. Early Muslim scholars forbade backgammon. It was prohibited based on sayings attributed to the Prophet Muhammad regarding gambling in general and backgammon in particular. 
such as, quote, whoever plays backgammon, it is as if he puts his hand in the pork and pig's blood. <laughs> uh, That's in, I guess, the Quran, or Muhammad said it somewhere. He said, literally, who, this is a direct quote from Muhammad. Whoever plays backgammon, it is as if he puts his hand in the pork and pig's blood. First of all, pork and pig, same thing. Is he saying the pork as in the flesh of the pig and the pig's blood? Don't know. Well, either way, I'm going to agree to disagree with Muhammad on that, that it is But not... he's a prophet, Brandon. You... Oh, man, you better take that back quick. No, but I, I don't think it's the same. Because what if you're just playing to play? What if you're just playing for the love of the game, well, not for money? Well, here's the note on that. Contemporary Ayatollah Ali al-Sistani of Iraq. You know Ali, right? Friend of the show. The Ayatollah of rock and roll? <laughs> yeah. Not Chris Jericho. He, well, this Ayatollah was one of the prominent religious leaders of Shia Muslims, issued a ruling that chess and backgammon mm -hmm. are absolutely forbidden even oh. without placing a bet. <laughs> Okay, fucking fun police. Yeah, well, like, why? I mean, my best guess, like, if I was gonna, if I was a lawyer, and my job was to argue and justify on the side of this mm -hmm. argument, I would say that if you play backgammon, even without the betting, it's a gateway drug into gambling, right? I mean, that has to be it. I mean, I think I could shut your ass down in court pretty good, pretty good on that. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. I mean, but yeah, that's maybe the best argument you can make. It all just seems so stupid and pointless. And like, like why are we wasting energy on this? Chess and not uh, checkers? Yeah. It's all so, yeah, it's, it's dumb. Sorry, said it. How do they feel about Battleship? Is that okay? I don't think the Prophet Muhammad had any quotes on Battleship, so it must be okay. Well, oh, sorry. Do you have any more on Batgammon? No. This game might be Batgammon rebranded. I'm not sure is Othello on the list. Othello? It yeah. starts with an O? Yeah. Uh, that's number 12. Oh. How about... We just mentioned them. How about checkers? Them as if they're a people? <laughs> yeah, all, you know, the checkers. Ch <laughs> uh, chubby and... Uh, what's another checker? All right. Damn it, I I'm, can't I'm do it. I'm just going to hang on. Chubby no. checker is the only checker I know. What is that from? Chubby checker? The, yeah. like, singer, like a 50s singer. All right, Grandpa. Checkers is number two with 50 billion units sold. Now, remember, number four was Scrabble with 150 million. Mm -hmm. So, Checkers has sold what is fi whatever 50 billion, like, that's, I don't know, thousand, a million times the amount of Scrabble. It's just crazy. But it's because it's been around forever. It's been around since uh, at least 3000 B.C., so I guess Checkers and Brandon have something in common, right? This is some Mesopotamian shit. The game's also known as Draughts or Droughts, D-R-A-U-G-H-T-S. Yeah, I don't know. Checkers is actually like a, a sub game of Droughts. I'm going to call it Droughts. It's existed since 3000 BC since a board of the game was found in Ur. Ur? You are? Ur. All right, Professor. How do you play Checkers then? Uh, you got your red and your black little chip things, your Checkers. Mm -hmm. Little round things. You put them on there. You can move forward, but you can't move back unless you're a king. And you get to be a king if you get to the other side. And if you hop over the other guy's checkers, he's got to give them to you. Yep. And the last one, the one who loses all their pieces first, loses. <laughs> Usually cries and throws the board over. Yeah. Or says it's not fair and demands a rematch. <laughs> checkers, I don't have a lot of notes on actually. Nothing I could find was that interesting. It's so basic. Have you played checkers with your kids within the last like year or so? I'm sure no, you have no. during quarantine. No? No, I haven't. No. I don't, we don't own a checkerboard. Oh, I do not hold back when we play board games. But that's a good idea though. I love to dominate what? my children at games. When I get like a trip, you ought to see, look at the face on a seven-year-old when you do a triple jump. The third little <laughs> click, like every click, their face drops. Mm. Yeah. Ugh. Click. Ugh. It's powerful, especially yeah. if that third click ends at the end of the board and you get to say king me on top of it. You said it's such a simple game, and it is, but that has not stopped the fucking uh, English, the Brits, from having mm -hmm. a world championship tournament every year since the 1840s. Now, what, what do you have to say about that? Are you going to enter the next world championship tournament? No, I, I don't think I'm very good. 
I know it's not the same as chess. There aren't as many moves and you don't be like... Not even you know, close. You have to be a genius to be like an expert chess player. But is there such thing as someone who's like the world's best checkers player? Yes, the world champion. I just told you. Who is it? He's British, I, I guess. Who gives a shit? I don't know. Ken Jennings? Listen to this though. You compare it to chess. The number of possible positions in English draughts, which is checkers. Mm-hmm. I don't even know this number. What is this? It's more than a trillion. Uh, what's after a trillion? And then one more after that. <laughs> quintillion. 500 quintillion, 995... Quadrillion. Quadrillion, 484 trillion, 682 billion, 338 million, 672,639 possible positions in checkers. What does that even mean? Easily for you to say possible combinations of checkers on the board? I guess, yeah, maybe that's it. Anyway, there's almost as many possible positions in checkers as there are listeners of this show. <laughs> Fuck. There aren't that many, like, stars in the universe. It's <laughs> <That was> amazing. <laughs> We're doing great. Yeah. And that's despite a sidekick host like you. But do you know what it means by this? It says it has a game tree complexity of approximately 10 by the 40th power. Oh, no, I don't know what that, any of that means. I guess what they're saying is, have fun, don't get carried away. By comparison, chess is estimated to have between 10 to the 43rd power and 10 to the 50th power of legal positions. So however many combinations and positions are possible in checkers, even more in chess. There you go, aren't you? Isn't everyone glad they're listening right now to this? Isn't this just awesome? Like, this is so much better than anything else you'd be doing. Well, we're talking about chess enough. And we've got the number one spot and the number three spot open. Oh, and Well, nine. we also have six, six and, and nine. nine. Okay. But I'm pretty sure that chess has to be number one or number three. Well, which one is it, Brandon? I'm going to say it's number three. It's uh, not number three. It's number one. Fuck. Should have followed your gut. I did. My gut said three. Chess is believed to have originated in northwest India in the Gupta Empire, uh, where its early form in the 6th century was known as Chaturanga. Uh-huh. Which means literally four divisions of the military, infantry, cavalry, elephants, and char chariotry. That's a lot cooler. <laughs> I love that elephants is its own division of the military. Uh -huh. <laughs> but elephants didn't fight, right? You just rode on them. Did they fight? I guess they stomped people. Yeah. They had, yeah, maybe they swung their tusks and stuff. Swung their what now? Tusks. Okay. They're big. Yeah, I swing my tusk around sometimes too. They're big stabby teeth. I'm swinging my tusk around right now. The game of chess is represented by the pieces that would evolve into the, uh, so the original game, the pieces evolved into the modern pawn, knight, bishop, and rook. Mm -hmm. Thence, it spread eastward and westward along the Silk Road. The game reached Western Europe and Russia by at least three routes, the earliest being the 9th century and around 1200. It started to be modified in Southern Europe, the rules of the game that is, and around 1475, several major changes made the game essentially as it is known today. So the game of chess as we know it now, basically since 1475. Buck wild. Yeah, people are playing the same game that they played then. So in the Middle Ages and during the Renaissance, chess was part of noble culture. It was used to teach war strategy and was dubbed the king's game. That's pretty cool that it was used in like war rooms and shit. Yeah, well, instead of saying like, you know, I'm going to move my knight uh, to this space, they'd be like, this one's Tim. <laughs> Sir yeah. Tim, I'm moving him over here. Tim, move that way. You know, in Game of Thrones, those scenes where the like kings uh, are planning their battles and attacks and they're yeah, going they to be little, like... little little wooden pieces on a big map. Yeah, essentially like a glorified chessboard. I fucking always love those scenes and I'm, my eyes are always studying that board. I find it so fascinating. Or like they have it in, uh, in war movies too, like World War II movies. There's usually a board with like ships and pieces on there and then they take like a, a wooden stick and, mo and move some off, pull some off when you've uh, captured mm -hmm. that area. Mm -hmm. And now, well, everyone's just using Excel spreadsheets. We need to have one of those boards uh, for enemy podcasts. <laughs> yeah, podcasts we want to wipe off the face mm -hmm. of the planet. We want to subjugate them. Okay, so 
Known in the circles of clerics, students, and merchants, chess entered into the pop culture in the Middle Ages. And during the Age of Enlightenment, chess was viewed as a means of self-improvement. Benjamin Franklin himself, listener of the show, in his article, The Morals of Chess, published in 1750, he wrote, quote, The game of chess is not merely an idle amusement. Several very valuable qualities of the mind, useful in the course of human life, it's so heavy, are to be acquired and strengthened by it, so as to become habits ready on all occasions, for life is a kind of chess. Is there anything that Benjamin Franklin couldn't pat himself on the back about? Mm, fucking how to not be a horn dog. He couldn't <laughs> pat himself on the back about that. I mean, I get it. He's super smart. He's into a little bit of everything. But like, come on, man. Quit showing off. <laughs> well, that's Ben Franklin. That's just Ben. He's the OG. Show off. All right. A few more notes here. I'm not even going to explain how to play the game because... Do you I know how even... to play chess? No. No, I don't. I only Do very... Only over quarantine have I learned every single piece and like, can I reliably remember what move they make too difficult for me not gonna do it i'm good against an eight-year-old yeah right i haven't tried actually i did play online against other adults briefly and i got like slapped mm -hmm. down so i stopped playing the game you should play with your eight-year-old is scrabble <laughs> fucking kill him at that <laughs> so in the united states alone around three million copies of chess are sold every year and by 2022 the chess market is worth estimated to be worth $41 million in North America alone. And across the board, more than half of all chess players are age 18 to 34. Mm -hmm. I would not have thought that. I would have thought more than half are old men, but they're all youngsters. And get this, 43% uh, in Russia and 70% in India, those numbers, that's how many of the adult population are regular chess players. 70% of Indian adults, adults are playing regularly chess. Regularly play chess. Where the hell are 70% of Indian adults even getting a whole, like, I've seen movies where there's like giant shanty towns. Yeah. Are the people in shanty towns playing chess too? Yeah. Yeah. A traveling, you know, Westerner comes by, leaves the game of chess, shows them how to play. You leaves don't need to understand modern society <laughs> to know how to play chess leaves them a copy of the new testament and uh, and chess yeah he should have left him sorry though so they could pop that little bubble sorry which one or is that sorry trouble? has the yeah which one is the one the bubble is it sorry or is it trouble or do they, they both, both have do. a bubble i think they both do my brother and i always broke the bubble we got really vigorous with our popping <laughs> and the game was ruined. You remember the YouTube video of the bell ringer, like that college student that's on the football field ringing the bell as fast as he can and it looks yeah, like... Yeah, at Texas Tech, he's ringing the bell and he's just having a way with it. It looks like he's jerking off viciously. If you yeah. haven't seen it, it's a five second video on YouTube. You know bell that ringer, video is almost Texas 20 years Tech. old now. I remember when it, I remember when it, like watching it on SportsCenter, the time, the time that it actually happened. Like live? Yeah, it was in like 2003, I think. I, I just had this memory of, of uh, being in my uh, apartment with roommates and watching that at Sports Center and like crying laughing because <laughs> we kept rewinding it. Rewinding it? Were you taping it on a yeah. VHS machine? Yeah, I think it would have been taped. I remember watching it over and over because it was unbelievable. Yeah, no, I, yeah. We had to rewind our tapes to get a GIF going. Well, that was you and your brother playing trouble, popping the bubble over and over. Hell yeah. That's the point. It was more like we were trying to give CPR to like, the, uh, like our last <laughs> loved one on earth. <laughs> Didn't you and your brother fight a lot on, at games? Yeah. Every, every time we played a game, we would end up in a, like a slap fight. <laughs> uh, boys will be boys. Well, let me tell you about the intelligence it takes to play chess. Mm -hmm. which that must be why you and your brother fell off. <laughs> Just started beating playing. each other. <laughs> Among the 605 plus million regular chess players in the world, according to chess.com, uh, across the board, chess players and non-players alike rank chess significantly higher than any other game or sport for attributes such as intelligence, sophistication, strategy, booty, perfection, and complexity, confirming top... <laughs> okay. <laughs> confirming top... <laughs> I, I mean, wondering. yeah. I slipped it in and I'm wondering if you would. 
I was wondering if you'd catch it. Compared to Clue. Yeah, you got a lot of booty on chess players because they're sitting a lot, you know? Sitting for hours at a time. I think that would make it flat. Um, but a relationship between chess skill and intelligence has long been discussed in literature and pop culture. Academic studies of the relationship date back to at least 1927. <laughs> and meanwhile, the, the most unhelpful sentence in Wikipedia history is this. Academic opinion has long been split on how the strong relationship is, as some studies find no relationship and others find a relatively strong one. Ah. Yep. So sometimes things are good and sometimes things are bad. Yep. Just like now, the lists I bring are good and the lists you bring are bad. Are you sure? We're, are we still going through chess facts here? <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll be excited to know there are 2,000 variants of chess played today. And my last Whoa. note is... <laughs> The Queen's Gambit on Netflix is a good show and you should watch it. That's it. Oh, I haven't seen it yet. It's great. There's chess, asshole. Number one. It's got the spooky girl from The Witch. Yeah, she's really good. Your company's salary cap is probably tighter and you can't afford to miss on a new hire. Every person you add needs to fit just right. Indeed.com is the hiring site that helps you find quality candidates instantly. So you can do the part you really need faster meeting and hiring great people. Indeed searches through the millions of resumes in their database to help show you great candidates instantly. With Instant Match, you see a list of great candidates with zero weight. Want our quality shortlist fast? You need Indeed. Right now, our listeners get a free $75 credit to upgrade your job post at indeed.com slash bluewire. This is Indeed's best offer anywhere. Get a free $75 credit at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Offer valid through March 31st. Terms and conditions apply. I only have two guesses written down and there's three. Okay. Oh, wait. I have there's three spots on the, on the board and I have three more guesses written down. On the board, huh? Was that a pun big, intended? Yeah. How about Chinese checkers? No. Oh, no. How about... I can't remember what the name of this game is. It's the one where... I think it might be called, like, Match Game. You have people on your side and the other person has people. Guess who? Guess who? That's a good-ass guess. I forgot about Guess Who. That's one of my favorites. That's not on there? No, not here. Let me tell you some other other ones that didn't crack the top 20. Shoots and Ladders. Mm Mm-hmm. Come on. That has to... That's bullshit. It's not in there. Uh, you already said Hungry Hungry Hippos, Mousetrap, Operation, You Done Fucked Up, also known in some countries as Don't Wake Daddy. Uh. <laughs> the picture on the box like every year gets progressively like more aggressive. Like he's got a belt next year in his hand. <laughs> he's got an alcohol bottle in bed with him. There's pills yeah. scattered by <laughs> the bed. There's a gun under the pillow. Catan. Oh, yeah, I believe you didn't guess Settlers Catan. of Catan, yeah. Ticket to Ride. I forgot Risk. Risk. Risk is number 12, uh, 14. Ah, yeah. Taboo. Jenga. Remember the tower game, Jenga? Love Jenga. Mm-hmm. Apples to Apples. Ah, uh, yep. Catchphrase. Okay, so I didn't, I just realized with Apples to Apples... You know, there's no board in that. It's just cards. So, I guess I was thinking too literal bo- lit- literal about the board part. No, I mean, it's all board games. So, okay. maybe Apples to Apples doesn't fit. I wrote down Apples to Apples. Oh, about it not being in the top 20. Yeah, not being in the top Got 20. Got it. So, okay. here's, here's 20 through 11. Connect 4. Uh-huh. That's 20. 19 is Cranium. 18, I think, is the newest game we've talked about. And that's Blocus. Remember that oh. one? It looks kind of like a Tetris on a board game. Uh, I don't think I've seen it. Well, you're an idiot. 17 is Mancala or Mansala? Mancala? Mancala. Mancala, Mancow disease. 16, Stratego, which is one of my favorites. 15, Settlers of Catan. 14, Risk. 13, Pictionary. Mm-hmm. 12, Othello. And 11, I've never heard of. Rumacub, a Rumacub. Rumacub. You're missing nine, six, and three, three, and they're all extremely famous games that you've definitely played, or at least heard of. Okay. Well, 
originally thought this was going to be number one. Obviously, it's not. So I'm guessing number three is Monopoly. Three is Monopoly. With over 275 million board games sold. Although, remember, Checkers had 50 billion. So Mm -hmm. it's a long way from the number one spot. The history of Monopoly goes back to 1903, when American anti-monopolist, as if it's a fucking job title, Wikipedia, (laughs) American anti-monopolist Lizzie Maggie created a game which she hoped would explain the single tax theory of Henry George. (laughs) It's like, okay. What a fun game. What a great idea for a game. Thank you, Lizzie Maggie, a professional anti-monopolist of 1903. It was intended as an educational tool to illustrate the negative aspects of concentrating land in private monopolies. She took out a patent in 1904, and it was called the Landlord's Game, which isn't quite as catchy as Monopoly. Uh, It was self-published in 1906. She created two sets of rules, an anti-monopolist set in which all were rewarded when wealth was created, and a monopolist set in which the goal was to create monopolies and crush your opponents. That's way more fun. Yeah. So it's like she created one that aligns with her belief system Mm -hmm. of what she thinks is ethical. And she created another which goes against her belief system. It's just weird. And guess which one everybody loved. Yeah. So Charles Dow, Dow, just some asshole somewhere, he adapted his own version and he called it Monopoly in 1932. Uh, Parker Brothers bought the game's copyrights from him. But when they learned that he did not invent the game, because uh, the woman did, Lizzie Maggie, uh, they bought the rights to her patent for $500. So think about that. $500. This is in 1932, which, you know, 500 goes a long way then, but it's still not that much. And now they've sold 275 million of Monopoly since then. So she done goofed again. They monopolized her. Uh, and then since 1991, when Hasbro acquired Parker Bros, they've been the distributor of Monopoly. So how do you play Monopoly, Brandon? You fucking oh monopolist. God pig well you get the little pieces and you roll the dice yeah so far so good god bless it's really hard to explain you basically try to screw over everybody else on the board and the real beauty in it is being like fucking smug and (laughs) (laughs) and chortling as you take the money from i think it's written in the rules that you have to chortle Yeah, is it not more fun when you're, like, really petty and competitive and, like, laugh when you... (laughs) Like, is that not most of the fun in, like, giving shit to everybody else who's playing? Of course, yeah. Uh, You got a believer in me, Brandon. You don't got to convince me. Well, anyway, it involves the practice of real estate since the player moves around trying to purchase property as much as possible. So, some other fun facts. The game has numerous house rules and hundreds of different editions exist. Like Pokemon Monopoly and probably fucking, you know, Pornhub Monopoly. Uh, it has spinoffs as well. Monopoly has become part of international pop culture, having been licensed locally in more than 103 countries and 37 languages. Uh, did you know that there's an annual Monopoly worldwide tournament? The next one's in March of this year, March 2021. Well, how are they going to have that in the pandemic? Well, maybe it's a fucking electronic video game version. It's not that far-fetched. No, it is. Okay. And some verbiage from the game Monopoly that has entered everyday pop culture, kind of like Seinfeldisms, you know? Get out of jail free card. Right. That's a commonly used phrase in everyday speech. It's a popular metaphor for something that will get one out of an undesired situation. I think Donald Trump could use a get out of jail free card about now. He's going to want one, yeah. Monopoly money is a derisive term to refer to money not really worth anything or at least not being used as if it's worth anything. Do not pass go. Do not collect 200. And the last one, Mr. Monopoly, which is the game's mascot character. And if your life depended on it, Brandon, could you tell me Mr. Monopoly's actual legal name, his birth name? Dickie John Monopoly. Holy shit, Brandon, you're a savant. You got it. It's actually Rich... Uncle Pennybags. Fucking dork. <laughs> How, what's your opinion of, mis- of rich Uncle Pennybags? Uh, bags of pennies don't sound like a guy's rich. Well, fucking, fucking back in 1903 it did. I thought of some more guesses while you were talking about Uncle Rich Pennybags. Okay. 
Ouija board. Holy shit. Ouija board has got... That's not on here, but I wonder if... Hmm. Maybe they didn't include it because it's considered like a tool of the occult or something. I have to think it has to be in here, right? I would hope so. It's not. Since I thought of it. Okay. Well, you're a Satanist, so we got it. Okay, so what about like a card game like Uno or Magic the Gathering? No, no. Okay. Think about like the, the world's most quintessential kids game. Well, I have some other ones I wrote down here and I okay. looked over and one of the games behind me is Candyland. Yes, sir. You nailed it. Ding, 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 I think it is the most boring game in the world. I just zone out. Well, we know you hate fun and children. You know, the game now doesn't feature it anymore, but I, when I was a kid, they used to have a section of the board that was all chocolatey and it had this like kind of poopy looking monster in it. <laughs> We're going to talk about Plumpy, don't worry. Oh, his name is Plumpy? <laughs> Plumpy the Dumpy? Uh, let's put that on hold. Put that on ice. Put Plumpy on ice for a minute. Okay. The game was designed in 1948 by Eleanor Abbott, or Abbott, while she was recovering from polio. So, asshole Brandon, you, you hate everyone with polio now? Is that what I'm hearing? Yep. Everyone with polio is a sucker? Yep. Okay. Quit faking it. The game was made for and tested by the children in the same wards on the hospital as uh, polio survivor Eleanor Abbott. The game was bought by Milton Bradley and first published in 1949 as a temporary fill-in for their main product line, School Supplies. So, I guess that's when they shifted to board games. Her test audience is like, hey, how did you kids like the game? And they're like, well, it's better than being paralyzed from the waist <laughs> down. So, yeah, I guess it's a good game. <laughs> yeah. Apologies to all of our polio listeners out there. We don't, Brandon does not represent the views of the Corporation Tennis Podcast. Candyland became Milton Bradley's best selling game, surpassing its previous top seller, Uncle Wiggly, <laughs> which sounds like Ew. the fucking uncle that you avoid like the plague. That sounds like the fucking uncle that has given like millions of Americans hey. fucking trauma for the rest of their Kids, lives. We all love Uncle, we'll see you in Uncle Wiggly <laughs> at Thanksgiving, right? Listen, <laughs> you're hanging out with Uncle Wiggly and he's not Wiggly anymore. You get the hell out of there. Exactly. <laughs> well, Uncle Wiggly was surpassed by Candyland. That's probably poetic since Uncle Wiggly probably used candy a lot. <laughs> And in 1984, Milton Bradley was purchased by Hasbro, which means they own the shit now. Candyland is a game that does not require many skills. That's the Wikipedia line. <laughs> Anyone can play the game, provided they know how to count. <laughs> the simplicity of the game makes it suitable for young children. Shuffling of the cards determines the winner in the game. <laughs> so Wikipedia is fucking shitting on Candyland yeah. pretty good. Uh, but despite the terrible game that is Candyland, it continues to sell at least a million copies every year. And uh, it was the most popular toy, period, toy, not just game, in the U.S. for the 1940s, according to the Toy Industry Association. Oh, God, what a... As if the, de the World War II isn't depressing enough. Uh, it was inducted into the National Toy Hall of Fame in 2005. Now, let's go over some of the characters. You got Queen, Frost, Queen Frostine, mm -hmm. who uh, became Princess Frostine. The classic Molasses Swamp was changed to Chocolate Swamp in 2002. Brandon, I know you have a lot of experience swimming Ooh, the through chocolate the Chocolate Swamp. swamp. <laughs> it is kind of sad that like the thing that 99.9% .9 of humans love most in the world, which is chocolate. Mm -hmm. is so close physically to fucking shit. <laughs> yeah, people call it like, well, like fudge. You constantly will, yeah, it's fudge or, yeah. So uh, Brandon, it almost makes you not want to eat fudge or chocolate, but guess what? You can't stop me. 
Yeah. And the, the, the character that was in that chocolate swamp was named Plumpy. He was like mm-hmm. a swamp monster looking thing. He looked thing. like a turd. He's removed in 2002, probably for that exact reason. Yeah. Brandon, let me ask you the age old question. Would you rather eat chocolate flavored shit or shit flavored chocolate? Shit flavored chocolate. Why? Because if it's the flavor of shit, yeah. but it's chocolate is not like full of bacteria that will make me violently ill. Yeah, but then chocolate's ruined for you for the rest of your life. You'll always think about that every time you try to eat chocolate. It would be ruined for me if I ate chocolate flavored shit. <laughs> I guess you're fucking right. The chocolate is going the way of shit no matter what in this equation. It's just the, all I can do wow. is mitigate the risk of salmonella. Hmm. Or whatever you get from eating poop. Like I said, fun hater. And speaking of shit, my last notes. Listener of the show, Patreon member Adam Sandler himself was in talks to develop a film based on Candyland <laughs> in Ooh, 2012. I'm plumpy. <laughs> <laughs> I think if Candyland has to be a movie, then I'm okay with it being an Adam Sandler yeah, movie. Yeah, it would have to be an Adam Sandler movie. That would probably be pretty good. Well, the deal fell through, so it's not fucking happening. All right, that's Candyland. Anything else uh, disparaging you want to say about polio victims? Children with polio? Or are you good to move on? Nope. All right, you just need number six, which is a big one. Okay. I've written down a few more, and I have one that I'm pretty sure it is now. But I'm going to guess a few others. Simon. Oh, as in Simon Says, no? No, Simon the red, blue, green, No, I know, I know. But isn't that also called Simon Says? No, it's just called Simon. Oh, well, you're... Yeah, we'll have to verify that, but it's not in here. Hi-ho, Cherio. Now, is that a real game? Yes. That's not a real game. It is. I so, haven't played tell it. me only real games from now on. Twister. Oh, that's not a tabletop game, though. Oh, these are on the table. Well, the one that I wrote down... I'm fairly confident is on the list. Trivial Pursuit. Brandon, I'm proud of you. You actually did pretty good on this list, which is far, 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 far from the norm. So, congratulations. Well, I had help in that I was able to look over at the shelf where I have some games. (laughs) Okay, so you cheated. No, it's within within my purview. (sighs) Well, thank you for destroying the spirit of this show, which is to guess blindly, but... Okay. Trivial Pursuit is number six with over 100 million units sold, worth about $2 billion. How do you play Trivial Pursuit, Brandon? Well, I play it well. Hmm. It's trivia questions about different subjects. Yep, that's it. You got to be fucking skilled in a bunch of subjects to be good at Trivial Pursuit. I am good at Trivial Pursuit. I'm not good at most of these other games, but I'm good at Trivial Pursuit. If you're asked a question on Trivial Pursuit and you get it right, you get to move up the board. When you make it to the end, you win. Boom. It was created in 1979. I think that's the most recent, if I recall. In a Montreal by a Canadian, Chris Haney. He was a photo editor, Chris Haney was, for Montreal's The Gazette. Uh, and Scott Abbott, his friend, was a, a sports editor for the Canadian press. After finding pieces of their Scrabble game missing, they decided to create their own game. And with the help of John Haney and Ed Werner, their friends, I fucking guess, they completed development of the game, and it was released in 1981. So, wasn't that interesting? They missed their Scrabble pieces, so they said, let's create a game. That is good. Trivial Pursuit is a good game. If you're just sitting around trying to, like, uh, kill some time, you don't even have to bust out the board game. You just bust out the cards. No, just bust out your fucking dick. You're good. They have a lot of different versions, too. Yeah, in the UK version, Trivial Pursuit players in the UK complained that the 2006 version of the game was dumbed down in comparison to previous editions with easier questions and more focus on celebrities and show business. (laughs) It's because you got the American version, bitches. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And the game has been adapted into TV game shows in the US, UK, and even Russia. (laughs) Next year's more Americanized version of Trivial Pursuit. When you open it up, it's just going to come with two sticks and you, <laughs> you, <laughs> you fight each other. One's red and one's blue. Yeah. All right. And my favorite trivia of the day, because I get to talk about Seinfeld some more. Mm-hmm. I'm sure you know where I'm going with this. In the Seinfeld episode, The Bubble Boy. Yeah. Here's the uh, line from the Seinfeld wiki. 
George was playing Trivial Pursuit with the Bubble Boy, and he asked him who you invaded... You gotta tell people who the Bubble Boy is. The Bubble Boy is just some uh, kid that's susceptible to germs, so he has to live in a bubble. <laughs> A bubble. Somehow George went to see him. Because the bubble boy wanted to see Jerry. Because oh, Jerry's right. like, he a, wanted to like a minor Jerry. celebrity. Yeah. And so George was going to meet him there, but Jerry got lost. And so George went into the bubble boy house by himself. <laughs> and the bubble boy's a real asshole. He's a jerk and he wants to play Trivial Pursuit. So George is playing and he has the trivia card and he says, who invaded Spain in the 8th century? And the bubble boy answered, what The Moors. The Moors, yeah. Which is the correct answer. But George, who is stubborn, <laughs> in reaction George, to... George, who is a bigger asshole. Yes. He was trying to stick it to the bubble boy. And according to the wiki, it says, in reaction to the belligerent arrogance of the bubble boy, which is spot on, actually. Bubble boy was a dickhead. And out of spite, George refused to accept the response because... It was a... <laughs> it was a misprint on the, right. car, the card, which said the moops. <laughs> And I didn't know this till today, but this incident is actually based on an actual error spotted by one of the writers while playing the, the home edition of Jeopardy. Oh, they, was the mistake really moops? That it does not specify, but one can assume. So after that, though, the bubble boy gets so upset that he stretches his bubble arms out <laughs> to George and starts strangling him. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then George like pulls away and escapes and it lets out all the air of the bubble and the bubble boy dies. Oh, shit. So I that's the show about nothing. Bubble Boy's dad is played by Brian Doyle Murray. It's uh, Bill Murray's brother. He's very funny. Fuck, I did not... Well, I mean, I knew that actor was in it, but I didn't realize it was his fucking brother. Yeah. Of Bill Murray. Two of Bill Murray's brothers are funny actors. His other brother, uh, Brian Doyle, or Joel Murray, has also been in some stuff. Okay, so Joel Murray is a basketball player in The Cable Guy, which I can recall that scene. Yep. Yep, that's He's right. also in Malcolm in the Middle. He's in the movie that has Mad all... Men. Yeah. He's Freddie oh, Rumson in 15 right. episodes yes, of Mad I Men. I forgot. He's Freddie Rumson. Yeah, he's, he's good. Freddie, he was really good as Freddie Rumson. That was a good character. But he's still not as good as Bill Murray. Okay. That's Trivial Pursuit number six. You did it, Brandon. I nailed that. Best selling boards games. What? Best selling board games of all time. The best selling board games of all time. I know. Yeah, even that though list. you cheated by literally looking at a pile of popular board games. Okay, so going back through the top 10. 10, Game of Life. 9, Polio Inspired Candyland. 8, Batgammon. 7, Battleship, which inspired the science fiction action movie Battleship. 6, Trivial Pursuit. 5, Clue or Cluedo. 4, Scrabble which was invented by Alfred Butts. <laughs> Three, Monopoly, which was invented by American anti-monopolist. Two, Checkers, or Droughts, Droughts. And one, the most best-selling board game in history, chess. And you're going to learn how to play it. No, I'm not. I'm so intimidated by it. Like, if you watch The Queen's Gambit, it goes into, on Netflix, it goes into the, the world of chess, like the competitive world of chess. And Jesus Christ, it's... It's incredible. It's, it's super impressive. There's a whole like subculture of chess. Yeah. My eight, eight year old and I basically started out together at the same level. Does he play it? Yeah. He knows all the moves. Our, in our games, I usually end up winning, not because like I'm so much more like experienced or anything, but obviously being 30 years older than him gives me somewhat a, of an advantage in looking ahead a couple moves. But no, at eight years old, he's pretty good. He likes doing it. 30 years, that's it? Wow, I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah. Okay, meanwhile, your kid's playing chess and mine's playing fucking Slapjack, the card game. Okay, so... <laughs> I like Slapjack. I like the fact that you get to slap. <laughs> yeah. Believe me, she does too. <laughs> you know, I've, uh, a list idea for later is the top 10 card games. Yep. That's harder though, because there's not best selling, right? It'd have to be like some other way to measure that, but because all cards are the same. Pokemon cards. Magic the Gathering. Yep. Do you ever have playing cards with naked ladies on them? Oh, baby. Don't get me started, Brandon. Don't get me, don't asking, get me revved you, up so late. Did you? No, that was a sin in my house. In my I don't, I don't, family I, house. They weren't like my family's deck of cards. Yeah. Okay. Weird family. So you did then? Yeah, again, not in my family. I was older. 
Yeah, I, and it wasn't like I had the deck of cards like, ooh, now I can finally see naked ladies. But they also make decks of cards with naked fellas on them. And when I was in college, some of our neighbors, a uh, group of girls, found, got a, had a deck of playing cards with naked dudes on them. And they came into our house when, or our apartment when we weren't home. And they hid all 52 cards in our stuff. So for weeks and months after they did that, I would like <laughs> put on a jacket and leave the house and go to a party and put my hand in my pocket and pull it out. And there's the three of clubs a blonde guy with a flagging boner sticking out at me. Yeah. <laughs> or well, I would open, it? there was one day I opened one of my textbooks in geology <laughs> and then playing guard with a naked dude fell out. It was an awesome <laughs> prank. We looked over the entire apartment and we knew that there were 52 n- naked men hidden in there. Or were they at least hot? Oh yeah, they were all studs. Okay, great. It'd be even better if they were not. If they were like Alfred butts kind of guys, you know? Or who was the guy that we said had the jowls? Waddington. Yeah, Waddington. That was actually the company's name, but fuck it. Let's go with it. He's the king of clubs. (laughs) Waddington. (laughs) All right, well, let's get some plugs down. We haven't done that in a while. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube at Tennis Pod. What about Parlor? Yeah, we're on Parlor. We're actually the founders of Parlor. Surprise. Actually, no one's on Parlor anymore. I just remember. It's amazing how quickly that happened. <laughs> you know, like the the rise and fall of Parlor. Yeah, we're not on Parlor. Don't look for we're us. We're not there. on Parlor. Yeah. Okay, and you can follow me on Twitter at the Nick Amel, and that's E M E L. And you can follow Brandon at Sidekick Host. You can follow me at Sidekick Host on Twitter. All right. That'll do it. Thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you next week for Brandon's List on episode 117. Thanks.